Okay, and so now set a motivation. Thinking to yourself, whether I experience pleasure, whether I experience pain, when I get what I want, when I don't get what I want, all of it is useful fuel for practice. May I see everything through the lens of bodhicitta. Okay, so um, Lagishima was saying about obstacles being a good thing or obstacles coming up during practice. Um, it's something that is really commonly spoken about, especially in the Tibetan tradition. Um, if there's like logistical issues, if things are harder than they normally are, it's just sort of random stuff happening. Um, in a way, it's a sign that your mind is moving towards so much virtue that. Um, all of the things that are not virtue in your habit energy are kind of um, rising up as resistance. And so the resistance you always have finally shows itself to you because you're actually orienting your will in a more positive way. And, um, and so when you have these obstacles, it's like, I, in a way, it's exhausting negative karma that you would otherwise have to experience in a much harder way. They always say in retreats that um, if you get a little bit sick during a retreat, it purifies or exhausts the karma of having a whole rebirth in a hell realm. So it's negative karma you've created, but because of the virtue you're doing now, that acts as a condition like a healing crisis. You know a healing crisis, right, in medicine? So it's like you, you get worse because you're getting better, and it's a good sign because you're clearing your system and clearing your system and clearing your system. Um, on the other hand, it's also when things don't run smoothly, um, we ask ourselves, what is my actual motivation? Because when things are running smoothly, it's easy to get into that kind of half-focused, uh, half-present, relaxed, generally happy, but sort of like the mind that you bring if you're, I don't know, sitting after work watching TV or something and you're just kind of passively watching it like an observer and not taking things to heart, not bringing them in. You can be a little bit more um, disconnected. And then when there's an obstacle of some kind, it's like a mindfulness bell that wakes you up. You know, so the internet is disturbed for a few minutes or, um, you know, something weird is happening with your neighbors in the yard. Suddenly they're cutting down trees and making all sorts of noise or this happens or that happens. It kind of wakes you up and go, oh, right, this is the point of what I'm doing. Samsara is so unpredictable. Yeah. So, um, so if there have been any obstacles, um, rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's been smooth, that's nice too. Um, but don't feel like it's a problem or a bad sign when there's obstacles. Often, um, the more powerful the virtue we try to create, the more things seem to come in our way. Um, but it's like we're clearing so much, so much more efficiently. Um, and so we shouldn't see it as a bad sign, but rather as a good sign in a way. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna now kind of move into the ultimate bodhicitta section of the text, um, all of the verses related to emptiness and to look at the way karma cause and effect in the relative truth sphere goes together with ultimate truth emptiness in that sphere and looking at them from two different angles in front of you. Yes. I'm gonna go through as if the outline of the text just so that you're really oriented of what section is trying to do what. Um, and so because it's your own copy, if you want to write gently and tidy in pencil, or if you want to write notes about it, you can. Um, and uh, so that's what I'm going to go through is kind of where we've gotten up to so far in terms of the layout of the text, um, and then moving into the ultimate bodhicitta section. Okay, so we're shifting to PowerPoint mode. So looking at the layout, 
verses one through six were the setup of the analogy. You know, talking about Yama, talking about Yamantaka, et cetera, et cetera, the peacocks, the crows. Verses seven through nine are the actual mind training instructions, how to do Tonglen. Then verses 10 through 45 are the relative bodhicitta, the win verses or and then hereafter verses, where it's basically talking about your causally concordant effects and your environmental effects. And having observed those karmic effects, choosing to do Tonglen instead of your same old pattern of reactivity and self-cherishing. And so, for example, starting at the beginning with verses one through six, we have the setup of the analogy. Verse six says, and thus bodhisattvas are likened to peacocks. They live on delusions, those poisonous plants, transforming them into the essence of practice. They thrive in the jungle of everyday life. Whatever is presented, they always accept while destroying the poison of clinging desire. So verses one through six are along these lines. And what it's saying is that you can thrive in the jungle of everyday life. Thrive, you can flourish, you can increase your qualities, you can progress along your path. You don't have to radically change the contents of your life. You can have your same family and your same job and your same joys and your same fears. Things can be the same. And whatever is presented, you always accept as this is what's happening. This is the way in which I can destroy the poison of clinging desire and have a very happy life, but not only a very happy life, a very effective life, creating a ripple effect around you that's of benefit to all. So that's the first little section setting up the analogy. And then verses one through nine, the mind training instructions. This is the how, okay? How to do Tonglen, how to do taking and giving. So for example, verse seven says, uncontrollable wandering through rounds of existence is caused by our grasping at egos as real, meaning inherently existent self. This ignorant attitude heralds the demon of selfish concern for our welfare alone. We see for our own egos. We want only pleasure and shun any pain. But now we must banish all selfish compulsion and gladly take hardship for all others' sake. So that last line is the instruction how to do Tonglen. So we're banishing self-compulsion. Uh, similar to the verse in um, Seven Point Mind Training of Geshe Chekawa, where he says, banish the one to blame for everything. Banish the one to blame for everything, meaning the self-cherishing thought. Here, Alexander Berzin has translated it as selfish compulsion. Yeah, but the meaning is the same. So we're banishing it by saying it's incorrect. It's mistaken. It's not me. It doesn't help. And what actually helps is adopting an attitude of taking on hardship for all others' sake. So adopting an attitude of taking on hardship for all others' sake is not the same thing as taking people's problems or being the fixer or wanting to um, solve every problem or be the log logistics queen or king. It's not like that taking hardships for all others' sake, you start with your own and you think, okay, what's going on with me? You know, anything that is difficult physically, anything that's difficult mentally, all of that, I could give myself permission to be less kind. I could let, let myself have permission for being less patient, less focused, et cetera, et cetera. If I'm suffering, I might let myself off the hook in terms of my behavior and in terms of my care for others. But if I take on my own hardship for the sake of others, what that means is I'm not going to give myself permission to backslide because I'm so suffering. I'm actually gonna to rise to the challenge and say, I can be kind, I can be open, I can be patient despite the fact that I'm suffering, maybe even because of the fact that I'm suffering. Maybe the suffering is softening me. 
May this, maybe the suffering is waking me up. So taking on my own hardship for all others' sake, it's a, it's a grand, heroic, courageous motivation. And it winds up making your own issues and problems seem like less of a big deal and less problematic because you're holding the greater good in your mind. And then you're taking on the hardship of all others. When you take on the hardship of all others, you're doing a lot of things simultaneously. The first thing you're doing is that when people are badly behaved, you don't then give yourself permission to treat them badly. Like I will punish you for your bad behavior by giving you a grumpy face or freezing you out or being overly blunt or whatever your particular way of reactivity is. You're deciding to take on their hardship and not be reactive to it for their sake. You're giving them a break. It doesn't mean that you're becoming a doormat. It doesn't mean that you're letting them walk all over you. It means that you're deciding to be bigger than their affliction. It means that you're deciding to not identify them with their affliction or their suffering. It means that you're speaking to their Buddha nature, not to all the surface facade and all the problems from it. So you're taking on their hardships for their sake as well. And then specifically in the Tonglen practice, you're imagining that the specific hardship you're taking on, like, you know, if they're feeling very upset about something that happened at work or whatever, you think, may I have that suffering that they have right now, but not give it to my heart heart, but give it to the self-cherishing heart, which is arisen from the illusory concept of self. May I use their problem to benefit my path. So there's a lot of levels um, and a lot of instructions of how to do Tonglen, but verses seven through nine are talking about the how. And then verses 10 through 45 are um, actually doing the Tonglen. Yeah, so all of those verses through 10, 10 through 45, they're describing your causally concordant ripening results. They're describing your environmental results. So they start with when, dot, 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 hereafter, dot, dot, dot. So you see your current difficult circumstance and then actually do Tonglen instead of the same old pattern of reactivity, of self-cherishing. So for example, verse 20, when our minds are unclear and our hearts are unhappy, we are bored doing virtue, but excited by vice. This is the wheel of sharp weapons returning full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now, we've led others to acts of non-virtue. Hereafter, let's never provide the conditions that rouse them to follow their negative traits. Yeah. So, you know, you're really taking responsibility. Um, even if you're not continually doing, um, I don't know, leading others to acts of non-virtue, you know that you have in the past, you know that you've been a negative influence in the past, and now you're choosing to live differently, choosing to break the pattern. Um, another one is verse 28. When our minds become clouded, whenever we study, this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning, full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now, we have thought that the study of Dharma lacked prime importance and could be ignored. Hereafter, let's build up the habits of wisdom to listen and think about what Buddha taught. So this is talking about a pattern that we have of part of us is initially drawn to higher study, whether it's study of specifically Buddhist Dharma, whether it's study of psychoanalysis, self-psychology, etc., whether it's study of anything, quote, higher, um, we have an initial draw to it. And then because it's not um, something that's easy, um, we kind of leave it. We decide, oh, it's not as important as I thought it was. I'm going to ignore it. Or it is important, but I'll come back to it. And we kind of, you know, procrastinate and put off and leave it aside. And what this does is mean that anytime we meet study in the future, our mind becomes more clouded. 
and we create our own obstacles to when we actually want to study, then we sit there, we're studying, and things just don't make sense. They're all cloudy and obscure and vague and confusing. So instead of thinking, I'm stupid, I'm bad, this is hard, this is whatever, instead of thinking that, we think, oh, till now, we have thought that the study of Dharma lacked primary importance and could be ignored. Let's not do that anymore. Hereafter, or from now on, let's build up habits of wisdom to listen and think about what Buddha taught, or what Kohot taught, or what Jung taught, or what whoever it is that we're looking to for wisdom upgrade. Um, let's build up these habits to, of wisdom to listen and think very deeply. Yeah, to, t to take it seriously, to not take it for granted that we'll always meet the topics that we love, that we'll always meet the teachers and studies that we like, to not take it for granted. Um, you know, I remember thinking when I lived at Chen Rezig Institute in Australia, um, I lived there from, I don't know, 2002 until about 2009. And I thought, this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to live here, I'm going to study, you know, six to eight months of the year, and the rest of the year I'm going to do retreat, and I'm going to do that forever until my teacher dies, and then when my teacher dies, I'm going to go into long-term retreat, and maybe I'll come out and start teaching after that. We'll see. But my mind was, you know, this is going to go on for a long time, this study program. You know, my teacher at the time was only in his 60s, and so I had this impression that, oh, I've got at least, you know, 10, 20 more years of study and practice before I have to worry about what my circumstance is going to be. And then in 2009, His Holiness the Dalai Lama asked my teacher to go back to India to be the abbot of a huge tantric monastery in Mysore. And he was gone for six years. And so, you know, here I was like, oh, okay, I, I thought it would be 20 years, it was only seven, it was only eight, what? You know, here I thought that, oh, the next time I do that, that topic, I'll go more deeply into it. Okay, next time I'll go more deeply. This semester's hard, I've got a lot going on, I'm busy, I'll do my best, but you know, it'll come around again, it's fine, it's fine, I'll come back to it. And there are some topics that I haven't been able to ever come back to because no one else is teaching them, not even my teacher. You know, that was time when it happened. And I wish I would have leaned in and taken it seriously. Um, you know, and so, okay, he was away in India for this six year appointment. And then he came back to Brisbane and um, started a little school. But, you know, now he shifted the whole way he was teaching. He was no longer teaching to monks and nuns. He was teaching to lay people um, after work, which is wonderful and needed. But it means that it was only three times a week instead of five or six times a week. It was only an hour at a time rather than a whole day at a time. And it meant that, you know, progress was a lot slower. And, um, you know, the way it was back in the early days, it's never going to be that way again. And uh, I wish I had really leaned in more and given it more attention at the time because it was a really special time. And of course, there will be more special times in the future and more amazing teachings in the future. But I can't assume that I can always come back to something. You know, I think we will be able to come back to things. However, that attitude makes us a bit lazy. Yeah, and it makes us take this precious thing for granted. Um, if we take it for granted, then it gives us permission to ignore it and do it when it's convenient. And at the end of the day, you know that you feel like you've led a meaningful life when you've thoroughly engaged with things you find important. And on days that you haven't thoroughly engaged with things you find important, those are the days you forget about. Those are the days you don't remember in 10 years. They didn't really have much significance. So, you know, a meaningful, significant life is one where we don't have a habit of ignoring what's important, that we build up a habit of listening and thinking really deeply. So this is a, a bit of a kick in the bum kind of a verse, and I think it can be really useful. So those are those first three sections, the analogy, the mind training instructions, and the win verses. 
Then we have verses 46 through 49, which is like an initial summary, yeah, and conclusions that we're to make. And having come to those conclusions, we realize we could use a bit of backup, we could use a bit of support, and so we request Yamantaka, or we request the wrathful embodiment of wisdom to help us in this process, because seeing ourselves more clearly can be actually quite scary. You think, oh goodness, I thought I was doing quite well, but then I really thought about it, and I saw how many unfortunate habits I have. Oh my gosh, I need some support. So verses 50 through 55 are requesting Yamantaka for a bit of support. And then verses 55 to 91 are what I like to call the hypocrisy verses. So the hypocrisy verses are basically looking at the ways in which we think we are one way but act another, and all of the ways that we have projection. So verses 46 to 49, the initial summary and conclusions. Um, here's a good example, verse 46. In short, Whenever unfortunate sufferings we haven't desired crash upon us like thunder, this is the same as the smith who had taken his life with a sword he had fashioned himself. Our sufferings the wheel of sharp weapons, returning full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Hereafter, let's always have care and awareness, never to act in non-virtuous ways. Yeah, so this is the summary of all that has come before, isn't it? This is really saying, um, here's the state of affairs. Um, basically, what's happened is that we're like a blacksmith who spends their whole life making weapons, and then we wind up um, killing ourselves on the very thing that we made, or, you know, hurting ourselves on the very thing that we made. So um, the footnote says, it is never possible for us to experience the consequences of the non-virtuous actions of others, okay? Whatever sufferings we have must be the result of non-virtuous actions we ourselves have committed in the past, right? This is referring to one of the four certainties of karma that we talked about on the first day. So it's saying, of course, practice Tonglen, adopt the attitude of taking on the suffering of others, but you can't actually do it you're providing a very strong condition for their virtue, and that's a wonderful, important thing. But what you're doing is adopting an attitude that says, I can be bigger than this moment, bigger than these afflictions, bigger than my reactivity. I can actually hold all of this. Um, I can be the grown up here. So um, adopting the attitude of Tonglen, don't take it so literally. Taking the suffering of others, is an attitude. What's actually happening is that we're having a very compassionate heart, which means we are a very powerful condition, not cause. We're a very powerful condition for other people. And that means that they might actually have some relief of suffering, but it's not like we took their suffering, we created a condition for them to have their own positive seeds ripen or their own negative seeds finish quicker. Okay, so just remember that Tonglen, for the most part, is just a mental attitude that's very, very helpful to adopt. So then we go into verses 50 to 55, which are requesting Yamantaka, the wrathful embodiment of wisdom. And that's where we had those really full on verses that say, batter him, batter him, rip out the heart of our grasping for ego our love for ourselves, trample him, trample him, dance on the head of this treacherous concept of selfish concern, tear out the heart of this self-centered butcher who slaughters our chance to gain final release. So we're asking Yamantaka to basically beat up our self-cherishing. Yeah, we're saying, okay, I know self-cherishing isn't useful. However, I'm really attached to it. I'm really used to it. And I think of it as my protector. I think of myself cherishing as the thing that is helping me. Um, and I know better intellectually, but psychologically, there's just this feeling of, no, but if I don't look after myself, no one will. If I don't look after myself, no one will. So saying embodiment of wisdom, wrathful embodiment of wisdom, help me see 
the real enemy is self-cherishing. Help me see that it is not me. Help me see that it is not helping me. And as I do that, please help me tear it out so that I am freed from this sickness. And so then we go to verses 55 to 91, which are the hypocrisy verses. And these ones can really make us cringe. When we read them, we see ourselves in these verses. Hopefully we see ourselves in these verses. If you don't see yourself in these verses, that might be a bit of a problem. Um, it doesn't mean that we do these things all the time, or it doesn't mean that we still do these things. These might have been things that we did as children or young adults or something like that. But you need to be able to find that place in yourself that knows your own hypocrisy. And we know what happens if you're very self-aware, you are not so defensive. If you're very self-aware and someone criticizes you, you know very immediately, is that criticism accurate or not? You know, so for example, if someone says to me, oh, Yintin, you're talking too fast. I can say, you're quite right. I probably am, because <laughs> I know that I am. And still sometimes I can feel like a little bit of um, defensiveness arise. And then I think, if I'm listening to someone else teach and they're going really fast, um, is it something I like or something I don't like, you know, and I try and think about, am I holding other people to a standard that I don't hold myself up to? And, you know, you just really look at yourself and ask, hmm, am I living the way I want to be living? Or am I doing the way, what I want to be doing? So verse 61 sort of makes me smile. Um, we have done very little to benefit someone, yet always remind him of how much we have done. We never accomplished a thing in our lifetime, yet boasting and bragging, we are filled with conceit. So this is really human nature, isn't it? Like you did one thing, like, I don't know, you gave someone the better parking spot, or um, you did some little inconvenience to you for the sake of someone else, and then you're so proud of yourself, and you tell them, you're like, do you see what I did? See what I did for you? Yeah, I did that for you. I'm a good person. You know, we're so full of it, you know. And um, when we read these verses, we should really laugh at ourselves and say, oh my goodness, I'm so full of self-deception. I'm so self-centered. This is not the way I want to be living. So trample him, trample him. Dance on the head of this treacherous concept of selfish concern. Tear out the heart of this self-centered butcher who slaughters our chance to gain final release. So you read these verses and you try to find yourself somewhere within them, that it's something you have done, still might do, something you can relate to some aspect of, and you just sit with, okay, that is nonsense. That is human nature and understandable, but it is nonsense. And not only nonsense, it's actually quite harmful and prevents my progress. Let's cut it out. So remembering that all things that seem violent are actually wrath, and that this wrath or wrathfulness is just a strong action of inner confrontation, a strong action of a bright and clear self-awareness because you have faith in yourself to be different, because you have some conviction in your own Buddha nature and that that is closer to what your identity is than any of your afflictions or your weird habits. So um, you can tear it out. So another hypocrisy verse, we have selfish desires and horrible anger which fester inside us, we would never admit. Yet without provocation, we criticize others and self-righteously charge them with faults we possess. So this would be some good old fashioned projection, right? Um, it's, I think it's nice to see that in Buddhism, there's a really clear description of things that we observe within the, psycholog the psychology field as well, isn't it? Um, that we criticize others and self-righteously charge them with faults we possess. 
It's interesting, isn't it, how we do that? And so um, to notice it, to trample it. Okay, so that's that next set. Summary, conclusion, requesting Yamantaka, hypocrisy verses. So then we have a second round of Yamantaka requests. Um, you see your own hypocrisy and again go, oi, I really need some support, yikes, okay. And then verses 94 and 95 are your and so, or therefore, kind of conclusion and summary verses the second round of those. And then verses 96 to 103 are what we've been reading each night for the dedication verses. They're dedication verses related to relative bodhicitta. So verses 92 to 93 are the second round of Yamantaka requests. So we say, Almighty destroyer of selfishness demons, with body of wisdom unchained from all bonds, Yamantaka, come brandish your skull-headed bludgeon of egoless wisdom of voidness and bliss. Without any misgivings, now wield your fierce weapon and wrathfully swing it three times round your head. So um, in the iconography of Yamantaka, he has um, a big club with a skull on it. You know, it's really full on, it's really primitive. It's, you know, just like, looks like a cannibal or something. And um, it's, you know, this really frightening looking thing. And we're asking Yamantaka, you know, swing it around and like beat the selfishness demons. Um, Self-cherishing, of course, is not an extra, sentient being in you. It's not like we're possessed or something, but it can be useful to adopt the attitude of um, self-cherishing being like an additional entity, being like a demon inside of you. Why? Because we're so used to thinking of self-cherishing as us, that whenever we say, tear it out, cut it out, beat it up, you feel like, oh no, you know, and you kind of cringe. So if you can turn the mind to thinking, this is not me, this is the enemy, this is a demon, then, it's not, then it doesn't feel like any kind of self-harm or harm to anything um, to beat it up. So we request Yamantaka to swing three times round his head, his skull-headed bludgeon, representing both the wisdom of egolessness, common to both the perfection and tantra vehicles, so both Mahayana, as well as the non-dual wisdom of voidness and bliss, meaning emptiness and method. Yeah, wisdom and method. The three times he swings his bludgeon or his club destroy ego grasping, meaning self-grasping, two, our self-cherishing attitude, and three, our defiled bodies of delusion produced by these two types of ignorance. So our physical body that suffers, that ages, that gets uncomfortable, that dies, and our mental body of delusion that has so many habits of negativity. Yeah. So we're again, we're asking for a bit of backup. And you can think of Yamantaka personified. You can think of Yamantaka one in nature with your own root guru. You can think of Yamantaka as your own inner wisdom that knows better. You can think about many levels of Yamantaka, but again, when we request, we become receptive and that makes it easier to transform. Just like uh, it's hard to take advice unless you've asked for advice. And so then we have verses 94 to 95, kind of, and so Tonglen conclusion and summary verses once again. 94 says, with all of the sufferings that others experience, smother completely our selfish concern. The sufferings of others arise from five poisons, thus whichever delusion afflicts other beings, take it to smother delusions of self. Yeah, so again, you're just, it's just reinforcing this Tonglen attitude of all that is problematic, all that is difficult about other people, all that is suffering in other people, all that we don't know what to do, let's imagine instead of pushing it away or getting frustrated 
or getting too entangled and too intrusive and interfering and trying to fix everything. Instead of doing that push or pull, we imagine breathing it in and making it go smother or suffocate or squash all the delusions about self. So I'm guessing that some of you think, oh, that's like repression. That's a terrible idea. You, can't, you shouldn't repress things. That's going to lead to all sorts of mistakes down the track. Um, and that's not what it's saying. It's saying you're acknowledging these delusions about how your self exists. And then you're imagining that you need all sorts of things to squash it. So you take the sufferings of others and the bad behaviors of others and you give it to that self, the false self. Yeah, so it's smothering your delusions so your wisdom can arise. Yeah. And then we have the, just talking about the dedication verses relative bodhicitta. So um, verse 97 is thus accepting ourselves, all deluded non-virtuous actions that others have done in the past, in the present and in the future with mind, speech, and body. May delusions of others, as well as our own, be the favored conditions to gain our enlightenment, just as the peacocks eat poison and thrive. So um, this is kind of saying everything that we've done up until this point, may it lead to our enlightenment. And may we remember that um, the delusions of ourselves, of others, past, present, and future, body, speech, and mind, all of that is useful. So um, that's the main section, um, which is all basically relative bodhicitta. Yeah, up until verse 103 is basically relative bodhicitta. There's some references to ultimate peppered in there, but mainly it's relative. Then we get into ultimate bodhicitta, verses 109 to 119. And so Looking at ultimate bodhicitta, ultimate bodhicitta is the wisdom realizing emptiness of inherent existence in the mind of an Arya bodhisattva. Okay, so an Arya is someone who has realized emptiness perceptually. You could be a regular Arya or you could be an Arya bodhisattva. An Arya Bodhisattva is someone who has realized Bodhicitta, obviously. So they have, you know, uncontrived Bodhicitta, uncontrived renunciation. And on top of that, they've achieved the path of seeing. Yeah, they're an Arya being who's realized emptiness directly. So when we say ultimate Bodhicitta, we're not saying emptiness per se. We're saying the wisdom realizing emptiness in the mind of someone who has Bodhicitta. Yeah. So when you see ultimate Bodhicitta, think that. Verses 104 to 119 are basically teaching us how to have ultimate bodhicitta. They're teaching us how to think about the illusory nature of life. So first is to see that there is an illusion, that things seem to inherently exist, even though the opposite is true. And then how to do that in your daily life. And so these verses are actually very poetic. Um, the first one, verse 105, O oh mind, understand that the topics discussed here are interdependent phenomena all. For things must rely on dependent arisings to have an existence. They cannot stand alone. The process of change is alluring like magic. For physical form is but mental appearance as a torch whirling round seems a circle of flame. So it's encouraging us the attitude to adopt about the things that we see. Um, if someone has, you know, um, firewood with fire on it, you know, or a torch or a flashlight, you know, it's just one point of light. But if they spin it around and around and around, it looks like there is a circle there. It looks like there's a real circle. And yet we know there is no circle there. That's just an illusion of the mind. But we get captivated. You know, we get sucked in. Um, the process of change, the way things change is alluring or seductive or tempting. It draws us in. We're intrigued by it, but it's a complete illusion. It's a complete mental fabrication. And so you can notice its beauty. You can notice being intrigued by it, 
but then break the spell. You know, break the spell by thinking it's not really there as it seems. It's not really like that. So, um, so these verses are really um, poetic and beautiful ways to kind of see the illusion of everyday life in a way that's um, strangely less aggressive than the rest of the verses. Normally when we go into verses telling us how to realize emptiness, they become much more, you know, cut the self, cut the self. But actually in this text, it's where it starts to get more soothing and it starts to gentle you. So it's like the first part of the text, you've been a little bit battered and you're like, oh my goodness, I have so much work to do. Now it's saying, don't worry, it's empty. Don't worry, it's empty. Okay. So, um, so we'll go through a few of those bodhicitta verses. So if you have it in front of you. Verse 106, um, similarly poetic. There is nothing substantial to anyone's life force. It crumbles apart like a water-soaked log. And there is nothing substantial to anyone's lifespan. It bursts in an instant like bubbles of foam. All the things of this world are but fog-like appearance. When closely examined, they fade out of sight. Like mirages, these things at a distance seem lovely but when we come closer, they are not to be found. So, you know, to think of our life force as like, a, you know, a log or a piece of wood that has been soaked with water, it seems solid from a distance, but then it just crumbles apart. Then uh, our lifespan is like, you know, bubbles of foam. You know, bubbles of foam seem solid from a distance, but then, you know, you just one little tap and psh, gone. So what we're trying to look at is this life, of course, there will be future lives, there will be a legacy, there will be an impact of this life. But this particular life, in the grand scheme of humanity and of existence, is so short. Things change so quickly. Um, it bursts apart. And all of the things in this world are a fog-like appearance. When closely examined, they fade out of sight. So from a distance, fog seems like a solid blanket of, you know, kind of white air in front of you that you can't see through. But then when you walk into the fog, it fades out of sight. Yeah, and it all kind of dissipates. This is how the things of the world are. They seem so solid, but actually they're illusory. And then like mirages or like rainbows or like things that seem visibly there but are actually just a trick of the light in your eyes, they seem so lovely, but you can't actually find them. So, so this is the way to think about things. If you want a more modern example, you know, think about a movie that you love and were swept into and sucked into you can be as emotionally engaged and as emotionally invested in a movie that is pure fantasy as you can be in some parts of your daily life, maybe even more so. And yet we think that when we have a strong emotion, that means that what's happening is more true. But we can have a strong emotion about things that are not true at all, that are complete fantasies and stories. So don't give emotions excessive significance. Don't think that emotions are wisdom. They're just information. Yeah, they're information for us about ourselves. So um, see it as a mirage. Any of these kind of terms can be really interesting. And then uh, verse 107. All things are like images found in a mirror, and yet we imagine they are real, very real. All things are like mist or like clouds on a mountain, and yet we imagine they are stable and firm. Our foe, our insistence on ego identities truly our own, which we wish were secure, and our butcher, the selfish concern for others, like all things, these appear to be truly existent, though they have never been truly existent at all. 
So it's, it's continuing with this idea of generally in your life, there is an illusion. But remember that the illusion also applies to this problem we've been talking about the whole time. Our, our foe or our enemy, which is our insistence or our adherence or our projection on ego identities truly our own or an inherently existent self. We wish it were secure. And the butcher, the selfish concern for ourselves, the self-cherishing thought that those two enemies are also lacking inherent existence. Yeah, so not just the, all the contents of daily life, the joys and the fears and the this and the that, also the problem we've been speaking about the whole time, that too is empty of inherent existence. It hasn't been truly existent at all. So it's a great relief, right? Because this whole time, it's easy to get kind of over-identified with self-cherishing and self-grasping and to see, you know, maybe even your situation is hopeless, but it's not. It's illusory as well. 108 reads, although they appear to be concrete and real, they have never been real anytime, anywhere. They're not things we should burden with ultimate value, nor should we deny their relative truth. As our grasping for egos and love for ourselves lack substantial foundations with true independence, how can they yield acts that exist by themselves? And then how can this cruel, vicious circle of suffering, the fruit of these actions, be real from its core? So it's going into samsara itself is empty of inherent existence. What we grasp at and give value to and give significance to doesn't have self-existent significance, but also we shouldn't deny their relative truth. Yeah, so we know that we are giving things significance and so they have significance. We're not pretending to not do that. We're just holding that with the same time and awareness that it's a dependently arisen significance, which is why it is empty. Yeah. Although all things thus lack inherent existence, yet just as the face of the moon can be seen in a cup of clear water reflecting its image, the various aspects of cause and effect appear in this world as reflections. So please, in this world of appearances only, let's always be sure what we do is a virtue and shun those acts that would cause us great pain. So, you know, it talks about the ultimate and then it talks about the relative and then it talks about the ultimate and it talks about the relative and they're woven together and it's, it's a really powerful way of living your life. So if you're you know, looking in a glass of water and you see the moon appearing in it, you're not pretending that there isn't a moon appearing in it. You see there's a moon appearing in it, but you don't believe that there's a second moon that has jumped into your cup and is now living there on the water. This is what it's trying to say, is that in our life, we can acknowledge what appears to be the case. We can acknowledge the stories we tell ourselves about why we're happy and why we're sad. But what we're trying to do is to break the continuity and the momentum of assuming that all of our, all of our story is a true story. That the storyteller is a true storyteller. That the fate or the conclusion or the celebration or the happily ever after or whatever, none of that is truly existent. Okay, and yet it still appears. Okay, so you're, you're avoiding either extreme by remembering things in this way. So there's a few more and, um, you know, there's some that I really love and there's some that um, I don't relate to as much. I think that you can um, find some that are really going to be provocative and excellent for you. But um, we'll leave the, the teaching there for now and um, take a minute and just meditate. So if you want to um, stay where you are, or if you want to back away from the screen, your choice. But now we're going to go into meditation. Okay, so um, coming back to your posture. So we'll just start by reviving our motivation. May we be the peacock in the poison grove.
And then shift your focus back to the breath. And just be with the breath for a few minutes, choosing not to chase after any thoughts, choosing not to slide back into any dullness, just staying calmly awake and vivid, watching the breath. And try not to anticipate and try not to fall into memories. But when you do, just acknowledge it, disengage, come back to the breath.
Stay with the breath. You know, you can come back to analysis later. Right now, we need more concentration and to give ourselves a time to digest what came before. Now shifting to analysis, think things look like, seem like, and feel like they are as true as they appear. Can I acknowledge that is how they seem, while at the same time confront the fact that is not how they actually are? Things appear truly existent, but they lack inherent existence. Things seem to exist from their own side, but they don't exist from their own side. Just sit with that. Everything has a nature, but it does not exist by way of that nature or from its nature. Nothing arises spontaneously, causelessly.
like a dream, a drop of dew or a bubble, lightning, a cloud. See all impermanent things like this. And even deeper than that, acknowledge the way we grasp that all appearances is real. Sure of our opinions. Certain of our projections. See if you can adopt a different attitude. That you are sightseeing your own illusion starting with your own I or self. It is all a fantasy of ignorance, yet still appears. And so just really make it very simple for yourself and ask yourself, is it possible for me to notice my own experiences without believing that my impressions about them are what's accurate? Can I at least open a little bit of space, a sense of possibility that there is more to the story or that there is no story at all? Just what can I think to open up that window of possibility? That how I think about myself in the world is not accurate. And that that is actually quite good news. It means so much more is possible. So much more happiness accessible. So try to put it into your own words. What will I say to myself to notice appearances, but not to believe appearances? And then dedicate the, all the energy I put into these thoughts. Go to understanding the emptiness of the agent, the action, and the object so that I can cut the root of suffering and develop my mind to its highest extent. All of this for the benefit of others, for all sentient beings, including myself.
Okay.